Good morning, church family. My name is Andy Hillman. It's my great privilege to welcome each one of you, extend a very warm welcome to you this morning. And I include in that those who have joined us on Zoom and YouTube. We want to especially welcome this morning those who might be here for the first time. Maybe you're a visitor this morning. Can I say a special welcome and invite you to join us afterwards for a cup of tea or coffee, time of fellowship before you head on home. We've come together to uh, sing our praises to the Lord, to pray, to confess our failings and sinfulness, to hear from his word, read and preached. We've come together to worship Almighty God. Just before we start, if you do have your cell phone, I wonder if you'd just check that it is on either silent or switched off. Thank you. The psalmist David wrote, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he, he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and he saves them. Let's pray together. Almighty, loving and faithful Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for the opportunity to gather as your children on this your day to worship you because that is what we want to do. So won't you now take away all the distracting thoughts from our minds of the week behind us, the concerns and the cares of the world around us, and just enable us in this time to worship you as we ought. Won't you fill this place and all our hearts with your Holy Spirit, Speak to us this morning through your word, read, prayed, sung, and preached, so that we might leave this morning with our hearts changed, renewed, challenged, and encouraged to love you more dearly, to follow you more nearly, and to serve you more fervently, because we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, is a testament to God's unchanging nature. It was written in 1923 by Thomas Chisholm, a man who suffered prolonged trials and illnesses throughout his life. And yet he chose to see God's faithfulness through it all. And this hymn, which speaks so much to my own heart, is deeply rooted in scripture. And here we are a hundred years later, and it continues to inspire and bless all who sing it. So I'm going to ask you, let's stand together and sing and make this our hymn this morning. Let's stand.
Amen. Please be seated. Although through Christ's sacrifice and death on that cross, we are forgiven, yet it is good and it is right that we come and confess our failings and sinfulness. Join me as we say this confession together. Father, we rebelled against you and you were angry with us, but you did not destroy us. Instead, you gave your son Jesus to die in our place. You pursued us and led us to faith in him. You justified us and declared us righteous in your sight. You gave us eternal life. You adopted us as your children. You gave us a new nature, writing your law in our hearts and minds. Yet despite your abundant grace, we still sin. We do things that we should not do. We do not do things we ought to do. Our thoughts are often impure, and you do, we do not love you as we, fully as we ought. Because you have promised, and for the sake of your name, please forgive us. Cast all our sins away from your sight, as far as the east is from the west. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Andy to share some news. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you this morning. My name is Andy Pike. I'm the rector here at Christchurch Howick, and I'll be bringing us the word a little later. But just for now, some news. Um, after a week in recess over the holidays, we were back in full swing. So all our midweek meetings will be on again. Um, uh, do come along to a Bible study. We've got one tomorrow at 10 o'clock where we'll be going through um, chapter 13 and 14 of Revelation. Uh, there's another one on a Wednesday evening that you can come to. Um, the Wednesday evening one is even on Zoom. So if you have an evening free and you've got Zoom, you can join us online at 7 o'clock. Just go to our website. Uh, the links are all there. All the different meetings are there. We'd love to have you join us. One particular meeting is our monthly prayer meeting, which will be this Thursday at 10 o'clock. Um, do come along just for a time of prayer. We'll be hearing from God from his word, and then we will be speaking to him in prayer about, um, about what, uh, what the church is doing. And uh, we rely completely on him, don't we, uh, for the work of the gospel and for fruits from that work. And then it's only about three weeks until our spring fair and poiki competition, so time is short now. And Myra's asked me, please, to remind you, um, there's going to be a poiki competition, pancakes, bake sale, plant sale, you name it. And um, we're looking for people to come and help us with all of those. So please, there's a list on the table. Either chat to Myra or put your name on the list where you would like to, to help out. Um, she has asked people to start dropping things for the um, white elephant stall uh, here at the church, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays in the mornings. You can uh, drop off uh, anything you would like to donate to the church that will be sold to raise funds, and anything that's left over will go to, to hospice at the end. So it's time for spring clean. Do uh, bring along uh, things that you think will be useful to someone else. Uh, the most important one, though, is we need two more puikis. We've got a puiki competition, which has actually been running for years now, and uh, we, we need two more puikis. So if you can help us there, enter the competition. Uh, we will refund you your cost of ingredients, but uh, come along, cook a puiki together with everyone else, and then uh, those, those will be judged and then uh, eaten as part of our day. I'm going to ask if the stewards now will take up the collection uh, towards the work of the gospel here at Christchurch Howick. Thanks. Thank you. Won't you bow with me in prayer? And Father, we pause now just to acknowledge that everything we have uh, is yours and has come from you. Uh, we thank you that we can give out of the abundance that you've given us uh, towards the, the work of making you and your son known here in Howick but also further afield. And so we pray that this money would be used for that cause. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, over the last couple of months, we've been introducing you to uh, the various members of council. And today we continue with that. Richard is going to be interviewing our most, uh, I think he's the most recent member to join the council, Rob Deneff. So I'm going to ask Rob and Richard to come forward. Thank you. Well, Rob, thank you for being available to interview. Very briefly, what is your secular work? Um, I am an agricultural engineer with the Department of Agriculture here at Sadara and have been for the last past 25 years and before that I was two years in West Africa doing similar work. And what is the land of your birth? That land is about 9,000 kilometers away from here. Um, the country that was for one third created by the Dutch, that is the Netherlands. And uh, I only came to Africa for the first time in 84. Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, I liked it so much that I thought this is the area where I want to spend my working life. So. Rob, both you and Sue came to us as enthusiastic and committed Christians. But you came from a church that in some respects was very different to ours. Mm. Could you tell us something about those differences? I think the, the church that we were in before Reach SA was a Pentecostal type church which had a big focus on, uh, on uh, end times but in a different way than Reach SA is doing it. Um, the, the, uh, the church looked very much at present day developments in the world and looked to pinpoint those developments, link them up with the text in Revelations, Thessalonians, Ezekiel, a much different approach than here. Um, but perhaps bigger even the differences would be that um, there was a lot of exhortational teaching, eh? encouraging, warning, rather than expositional, like Andy does it here, uh, reading from the Bible, going chapter by chapter. Another thing was that they somehow had the impression that you could lose your salvation. I think here at Reach SA we know that once you are saved, you are sealed and we don't believe that you can lose your salvation, which is the big hope that we carry in us, I would say. And then, yeah, almost typical of, of a Pentecostal church is that there is an, an, a focus on speaking in tongues. And in the beginning, as we came, that was much more subdued. But towards the time that we left, it was almost as if the belief had established that one wasn't a true believer if one couldn't speak in tongues or if one didn't desire to speak in tongues. I think these were, I would say, uh, big differences that in the end made us look for another church. And we came to reach as a on and off when there was big uh, Christian days like um, Easter or Christmas because they weren't really celebrated as such in the Pentecostal church that we went to. Rob, the, the kingdom of heaven is, is well, part of its beauty is it's a variety. The Lord has many different characters, many different people in it. But here you have two churches that are very different but actually have much in common. And both rightly claim to be Christian churches. Uh, and both their memberships can embrace each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Would you go along with that? I think if, if anything, it's, it's good to remember for us as Christians that we will find safe people in all ch Christian churches. And I would like to add, probably even in the Roman Catholic Church. There is enough basis on, in most denominations that are not called to, um, to deliver, so to speak, Christians to, that are going to be saved and, and go to heaven. I think the basic, the essentials is that a church believes that you are saved by grace, through faith 
in Jesus Christ and not by works. And I think that was the case in the Pentecostal church and that's why we, we stayed there for seven years. So that basics they had right. Um, and I think there was a full endorsement of the creeds as well in the church. Um, people talked about sins, a lot of wayward churches leave sin out as a topic of discussion or shove it under the carpet. Sin awareness is something that we, that the proper church creates and, and, and deals with in, in all its sermons and, and, and uh, messages. And I think that they did believe, I'm sure they believed there was no other intermediary between God and man but Jesus Christ. And so these things, they, they were sound in that church. Did you and Sue have any difficulty fitting in here? Um, as I said, we, we had visited this church on and off. We had some people whom we didn't mind sharing the church with, like the, the Webs and the Fuchses. So these were sort of our entry points to, to this church. Um, and uh, in hindsight, not in hindsight, but we were always more reformed people than Pentecostal people. So stepping back into the reformed fold, um, originally I'm Dutch reformed, was not such a big step. And, um, and in, in, in actual fact, I think this church fits us perhaps even better than all the previous churches before. And it's a godly church and I wouldn't li like to change it for another one at this stage. Well, we've been blessed by having you here and we've blessed at you on council. I must say, if Rob's got far more to say than we've got time to give him. <laughs> <laughs> Just get to know Rob and Sue and you'll, you'll have fellowship that's out of this world. Rob, thank you very much for your time and your wisdom. God bless. It was gladly done and thanks for the questions. Well, thank you, Richard and Rob. Do, do follow up with what Richard said. Chat to Rob and Sue. Um, they're a wonderful asset to our church. Um, I'm going to ask Steve now if he'll come forward and lead us uh, in a time of prayer. Thanks, Steve. Uh, let us pray. Uh, Psalm 128 verse 1 reads, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in his ways. So we'll pray, our first prayer will be the prayer for the, for the day, the colic for the day. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, we may run the way of your commandments and wear the crown of your everlasting joy through Jesus Christ, your Son and Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. O Lord our God, you are worthy of all our praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death and resurrection, we see your love, justice, mercy, provision, and victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighed down. You are the God who provides for your children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live. Be with us in worship and praise as we gather together here, and even those who are remote today, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you that your Holy Spirit governs and, sac and sanctifies the body of the church. We pray for our members and leaders here at Christ Church Howick, that we may honor and serve you in all aspects of our lives. We thank you for the message of the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which our redemption is proclaimed, and that many people will respond in faith 
and receive pardon and your gift of eternal life. Your word tells us that you do not desire the death of a sinner, but rather that they should turn to you and live. And so we pray for those we know and love who do not trust in you, that you will have mercy on them and bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus as their Savior, that they, together with us, may live to the honor of your name. God, please bless our land, the rulers and people. Lord, you know that all is not well in our country. Where there is corruption and lawlessness amongst our leaders, we pray that you will intervene to the glory of your name and the upholding of your laws. We pray that those who have been elected to govern our country will do so in a righteous and godly manner. Grant that all may live in obedience to your word and follow after truth, righteousness and justice to the glory of your holy name. Almighty and merciful Father, you told us not to think of ourselves only, but to remember the needs of others. We pray for all in want or need, for the sick in body or mind, for the poor and lonely, and for those in distress and despair, and for all those astrayed from your ways. Merciful Lord, deliver them, strengthen them, and restore your faith. Bless and help them. And, O oh Lord, we think of all this conflict that is taking place in the world right now. We think of the Ukrainian conflict, which seems to have no end, and the recent uprisings that have taken place in Israel. And we pray that your word will be spread amongst all the people there, and they will see your truth in this situation. And so, Lord, we ask that you will hear us as we lay all these prayers and petitions before you and trust that in your great mercy you will answer our requests through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Let's stand and sing. Um, I will sing the wondrous story, a grace and favorite hymn. Let's stand and sing together.
friends, we're continuing in our series through the book of Revelation, and we get to chapter 14 uh, today. So we're making steady, though slow, I think, progress, uh, hopefully not too slow. We'll certainly be through by the end of the year, and that'll be quite a thing. Imagine that, uh, having gone through the whole book of Revelation. As we've been going through it, uh, you, might have, you might agree that the book itself might be unique in its genre, that is in its style, in the way that John has uh, written the book. But I hope you'll also agree that it's not unique in its message. It's the same old story um, that that Christians uh, know and love. It's the message of a human race who has rebelled against God, rejected Jesus as its king, and chosen rather to rule itself. It's the story of a kind, majestic, holy God who is not pacing up and down, wringing his hands in despair, but rather a God who has acted, who is acting and will act, as we'll see today, to bring about his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, his great promise of what he would do. The trouble, the, the, the problem that God faces in doing that, though, is that he's got to come up with a way to deal with the age-old problem of evil, both satanic evil and also human evil. How is God going to bring about his kingdom on earth uh, and populate it with human beings like you and I when we are the ones responsible for bringing about the fall in the first place? You know, Eden was heaven on earth, and look what we did to it. How is God going to bring about a second Eden, as it were, without us messing it all up again? The problem of Satan and satanic evil is easily solved. Just lock him up and throw away the key. Get rid of all traces of evil from the world. But it's not that simple when it comes to people. What do you do about people like us who have done wrong and rebelled against God just like Satan did? Who do you lock up with Satan? Where do you draw the line? Murder is probably clear cut. I mean, we don't want murderers in heaven, do we? But should God tolerate sexual immorality or fornication or adultery? Should God tolerate liars and gossips and slanderers? Should God allow people like that into his kingdom? What about greedy people and selfish people and ungrateful people? Should they get a spot in heaven? Probably not, actually. I mean, who likes living next door to people like that, let alone having to spend the rest of eternity with people like that? So we don't want people like that in heaven, do we? Besides, God himself, and here's the biggest problem, God himself can't live amongst people like that. And that's God's ultimate goal, to live with his people, to be with them, and to bless them forever. That's the great promise of the Bible. And so the number of people who qualify for heaven shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until you realize that if heaven is going to be heaven, well, then only perfect people can be allowed in. And I'm sure you can see that there's a problem with that. You and I, if that's the case, are going to end up outside looking in. Well, luckily, God has come up with a solution. And it's a solution that is as scandalous as it is ingenious. God himself will pay for the sins of his people. He will pay for the sins of those who want to be forgiven. So let's look at this solution that God has come up up with and the final destinies of those who choose to accept what he's done for them and then the final destinies of those who turn God down. So I'm going to ask if our readers can come forward now and bring us Revelation chapter 14. Do follow in your Bibles or on your cell phone. Dig it out. Google Revelation 14 and follow with the readers. Thanks. Revelation 14 verses 1 to 12. Then I looked and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters, and like a loud peal of thunder. 
The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of, his, of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Amen. And then we carry on Revelations 14, 13 to 20. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple, and called in a loud voice to him, who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he was seated on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel, who had char ch charge of the fire, came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him, who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle. And gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, it's uh, one of the most vivid chapters in the book of Revelation. When you, when you come to a chapter like this, it's a bit like coming to a huge painting hanging on the wall, a bit like that, that, that painting at the back of our church. Uh, maybe coming to the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The key to understanding it properly is to step back and to take it all in from a distance. If you put your nose up against it and try and analyze every brush stroke, you're going to miss the beauty and the message of the painting. So too with this chapter. If we try and analyze every single detail, we're going to miss the whole message. So we're going to try and unpack it carefully and understand it in three different sections. I think it breaks down nicely into three sections. And the first section, I think, is summarized by this. John has shown Christ's redeemed people. 
Uh, have a look with me, follow with me from verses 1 to 5. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, we're not going to go through every single detail uh, in this chapter that we've already covered. For instance, what does 144,000 stand for? What is the mark of the beast? We've done all that, haven't we? We've looked at that. So go and listen to those sermons uh, if you're joining us midway through our series. But this 144,000 represents the full extent of God's people who, over the years, have chosen forgiveness. It's a number that represents God's people from the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a vast crowd. It's a number that represents a vast crowd, but it's not everyone. In other words, it's only 144,000, not 144,000 and one. It's limited, isn't it? It's only those who over the years have chosen to trust God's promises, have chosen to accept his offer of forgiveness. Secondly, notice that this humanity stands with the Lamb, we're told, with the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they are those who have switched sides. They've thrown their lot in with Christ. They identify with him and have even taken on his name. And thirdly, we see that these are the people who have exchanged the mark of the beast for the name of God. They'd once followed the ways of the beast, but now they belong to Christ and they are mar marked out as his. Fourthly, they are with Christ, we're told, in the new creation, which is literally heaven on earth. John here calls that new creation Mount Zion. They are standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion, the city of God, the perfect city, God's dwelling place with his people, a place that stands in stark contrast to Babylon, as we'll see later. And then verse 2, I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpers playing their harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So John is there, and he sees these people, and, and suddenly uh, all other sound is blocked out. That's what the roar of a waterfall and the, and the thunder represents. All other sound is blocked out by this beautiful music. And the music comes from God's people who are singing. And we're told that they're singing a new song. It's a song by the redeemed about their redeemer, the Lord Jesus, the lamb who was slain for their sins. They are worshiping and singing him and singing his praises. This is not, again, to be understood literalistically. This is not saying that eternity is going to be one long sing-along. And we're all going to have to learn to play the harp. There is a church in Durban who actually taught that. They, they got all their people, I'm not joking, some of them eventually left this cult and joined us at Christ Church on Plunga. They got all their people to literally buy harps and they hired a harp teacher to come and teach the congregation to play their harps, which cost between 50 and 100,000 rand each, so that to prepare them for this day for the day when they would have to play their harps in heaven. I'm not for one minute joking. This is not saying that eternity is going to be singing and singing and singing. How exhausting would that be? What it is saying, though, is that eternity will be, for God's people, a place of eternal joy that just wells up in you. A bit like when the Welsh win a rugby match. Long time since they did that. But when the Welsh win a rugby match, the whole stadium erupts uh, in, in singing. The whole nation bursts into song. And here we're told that it's a new song because those singing it didn't know it before they became Christians. Maybe you can remember something of that before you became a Christian. You might go to church and you would, like me, if you were like me, you would mumble the words of the hymns, the, the language was archaic, the music seemed so out of date, and besides, you didn't really understand the, the, what you were singing about. But becoming a Christian means that the words come alive, 
and you end up singing with all your heart, regardless of what the style of the music is or how well it's been played. You have a new song because now you really have something to sing about. And then curiously in verse 4, we read that these 144 Christ's redeemed people, we're told, are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. Well, what is this not saying? That's really important. It's not saying that heaven is only for celibate men. Okay, again, that should be to misread the book of Revelation. This is not meant to be understood literalistically. No, if we keep reading the rest of that verse, it explains itself. They did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins, and they followed the Lamb wherever he goes. You see, John is talking here about people who are faithful to the Lamb. They have made vows to the Lamb. They promise to follow him, a bit like a marriage. In fact, exactly like a marriage, a wedding between the Lamb of God and the Bride of Christ. And these are people who have not defiled themselves. They have remained faithful to the Lamb. They have not strayed spiritually. Since turning to Christ, they have not worshipped other gods. They have not been spiritually immoral or unfaithful. They have remained faithful. You see, God views backsliding as neglect of him. And he views flirting with the world as unfaithfulness to him. Becoming a Christian isn't joining a particular religion. Being a Christian is benefiting from God's love uh, and he is wholeheartedly committed to his people in love. He would never dream of backsliding in his relationship with you or loving you with anything less than all his heart. Because as verse 4 goes on to say, God's people have been purchased from among the nations and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. This is language from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the first fruits of every harvest were set aside to be used in God's service. They were devoted to God. They were a reminder that God is the one who had provided all their needs in giving them the harvest. And here is the similar idea. God's people are those who have been set aside to be used in his service. They are, his, they are to be his hands and his feet, as it were, and especially his mouthpiece as we take his gospel to a perishing world. And lastly, speaking of Christ's people, verse 5 says, No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Now, of course, Christians should strive to be blameless. They should strive to stop lying. But striving to be blameless and actually being blameless are two very different things, aren't they? We just said the prayer of confession. Why? Because we know we're not blameless. We strive for it, but we don't hit the mark. We do still sin as God's people. We're not here being told that Christ's people are going to be perfect. Rather, we've been told that God views his people as being perfect, as being blameless. Not because they don't sin, but because they have been made blameless, declared blameless, justified, is the legal theological term. Jesus gives his people his blamelessness, his perfection. And the Bible says that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. In return, Jesus gets our sinfulness and he's punished in our place. And we get his righteousness and are treated as though we had never sinned ever. So these are Christ's people. Those who have accepted his offer of forgiveness, those who have repented of their spiritual adultery, maybe even of their physical adultery too, and they've been made pure, and now they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they follow him wherever he goes, and they carry his name on their foreheads. Well, next, in the rest of the chapter, John sees six other visions. He sees three angels who bring the world a warning from God, and then he sees three angels who show us the final destiny of those who choose to ignore God's warnings and refuse to follow Christ, and refuse to carry his name, and choose rather to carry the mark of the beast with them 
into the grave. So secondly, three angels warn the world of coming judgment. Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. This eternal gospel is the news that Jesus Christ is the Lord of heaven and earth, and that God offers forgiveness to those who will worship Jesus as such, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And notice that this gospel announcement is for all the earth, for every tribe, nation, language, and people. You see, Christianity is not a white man's religion, as we are so often told. No, Jesus had a brown skin, not a white skin. And the gospel got to Africa before it got to Europe. I'm not sure if this is going to show up on our projector. Um, but in 2020... The figures came out showing that there were a hundred million more Christians in Africa than there are in Europe. Isn't that amazing? And I think that that trend has continued since 2020. So the angel's message is for the whole world. And the angel's message is simple. Repent and change who you worship. Verse 7, he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory. Because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. You see, living in God's world makes you automatically accountable to God. Basically, you live under his roof, and so he can make the rules. And his rules are simple. Actually, there's only one real rule. Worship Jesus Christ. He says here, worship the one who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, as the New Testament makes it abundantly clear. If God, if God the Father is the architect, well then God the Son is the builder. And yet, we dismiss Jesus and think that he is irrelevant to our lives. How wrong we are. Imagine if your goldfish or your houseplant dismissed you and decided that you were irrelevant to their lives. Well, here's a good test. When was the last time you even said thank you to Jesus Christ for your life and for everything that makes your life possible? We're very happy to take all the gifts that Jesus showers on us, but then we go and take all the praise for what we achieve in our lives as if he doesn't have any relevance at all. Surely the very least we should as humans be doing is finding out more about Jesus, just starting by reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surely that's not to ask, too much to ask. Find out more about your Creator. But then there's a second angel, verse 8. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Throughout the Bible, Babylon is the symbol of human beings in rebellion and opposition to God. It comes from Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel, where sinful humanity came together and said, let's build ourselves a city called Babel. Let's build a tower, a monument to ourselves, a monument that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. It was an exercise of self-glorification, and every human being ever since has done exactly the same thing. Declared independence from God and tried to make a name for themselves, to do it on their own, as it were. But the second angel announces that God will put an end to all rebellion and all rival empires. Be those global empires operating in opposition to him. Do you remember the first beast from last week? Or individual lives lived in opposition to him. It's all coming down, says this angel. This angel is a picture of someone trying to warn a city at the foot of an exploding volcano. Think Pompeii or Vesuvius. Wake up, get moving, get out while there's still time. Get out of Babylon Flee to Christ, where you will be safe. And the third angel tells us the reason for the danger. God's judgment is coming. 
If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. So there's lots, lots of drinking going on in this passage. I don't know if you noticed the drinking of the maddening adulteries of Babylon. And those who do that will here drink the wine of God's fury. This is very familiar, familiar imagery uh, from the Old Testament. Job, the Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Zechariah, all talk about God's judgment uh, as a picture of drinking from his cup of wrath. You'll remember that both the kingdoms of Israel and Judah both drank from that cup when they ignored the warnings that God had sent them through the prophets. And here that warning comes again, not just to God's rebellious people, but to the whole world. Of course, the most famous time we read about this cup is in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. It's the same cup, the cup of God's wrath of God's fury and he finishes that prayer off with yet not my will but yours be done you see God doesn't want the human race to get what they deserve he doesn't want them to drink the cup of his wrath and so he drinks it himself down to the very drop in our place he sent his son to take our place and drain that cup for us and now the ball is literally in your court Will you repent? Will you take on the name of Jesus who drank the cup for you? Or will you persist in your rebellion and choose rather to drink that cup yourself? The choice is really yours and God will honor your choice as we will see in a minute. This angel brings us a very solemn warning and God has been gracious enough to give us time to do something about that warning. Do come and chat to me or Richard or, or a Christian friend if you want to get right with God, if you don't want to drink the wine of God's fury. God is very patient, but at the end, in the end, his patience will run out, and those who insist in opposing him will receive the penalty for their rebellion and be excluded from, their, from his kingdom. Verses 10 and 11, they will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Well, whatever way you read that, it's very uncomfortable reading, isn't it? But we must remember that these are the words of a God who would rather die than see you punished for your sins. And die he did. But time is running out, and God's offer of forgiveness is running out. Once again, these descriptions are not to be taken literally, the sulfur and the smoke of the torment, etc. No, 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 that's a picture. You can go and read about it in Isaiah chapter 34. And it's not to be taken literally. You know, Jesus himself said that hell is a place of darkness on the one hand. And then he says that hell is a place of eternal fire on the other hand. Darkness and fire don't go together. After all, you light a fire, you light a candle, don't you? to fill a room with light. And so this is picture language. But it's picture language describing the terrible reality of being cut off forever from God and everything that is good in the world. And before you say that this sounds extreme and maybe even unfair, con consider the possibility that the punishment perfectly fits the crime. If someone is determined to live without reference to their creator, in the end, their creator will give them what they're determined to have. As C.S. Lewis put it so brilliantly, there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. God gives us what we want. He goes on to say, Lewis goes on to say, all in hell actually choose it there's a thought for you 
He's quite right. Judgment is coming, but not before God has given us ample time and ample warning to do something about it. But we must come to God on his terms, not ours. We must come and bow the knee to Christ and take on his name and start living in obedience to him for his honor and for his glory. And in the midst of the warning to the world, God gives a wonderful word of comfort and encouragement to his people. Verses 12 and 13, this calls for patient endurance on part of the people of God. Well, it certainly does, doesn't it? Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. If you do become a Christian, you will face enormous pressure to give up on Christ and to conform to the pattern of this perishing world. And so God assures us that our sacrifice and our patience endurance won't be in vain. Because blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, he says. Well, finally, the last three angels show John the final destiny of those who have chosen to take the mark of the beast instead of the name of Christ with them into the grave. And so the last three angels describe the coming judgment. Verse 14 is very sobering. John sees none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself coming in judgment. That's why I've entitled the sermon, Jesus Judges. Verse 14, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Interestingly, there are two words, uh, two Greek words for the English word crown, and the word used here for crown is different from the political crown that Jesus will wear when he comes back, a diadem, the king's crown, as it were. Here, the word is actually a wreath, a golden wreath. He is wearing the victor's crown, the victor's wreath, a symbol of honor and glory given to someone who conquers. And the message is clear. You will either meet Jesus as your brother who died in your place and conquered death by rising again, or you will meet him as your judge with a sickle in his hand. And his judgment is shown to us in two different ways, using imagery of a harvest from the book of Joel. Jesus often refers to this section of Joel when he's warning his audiences that the time of harvest is coming. For instance, Mark 4, as soon as the grain is ripe, the farmer puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And that's the picture we're getting here. In verse 15, the fourth angel announces that that time for judgment has now come. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come. The harvest of the earth is ripe. We're talking about a grain harvest uh, in this vision. After the years, the grain is now finally ripe, and the, mo the farmer mows it down with a scythe and separates the wheat from the weeds and the grain from the chaff. And so will Jesus separate the people of the world on the basis of their response to him and their allegiance to him. Verse 16 tells us the story of this harvest in a very matter-of-fact, unsensationalized way. He who was seated on the cl cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested, done and dusted. But it's the vision of the fifth and sixth angels that show us how truly devastating God's judgment will be. These angels give us a different perspective of the final judgment. And this time, the harvest is likened to a grape harvest. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And still another angel who had charge of the fire from the altar called in a loud voice to him who had the sickle, Take your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press. 
rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia, 180 miles, 300 kilometers. But this isn't a second event, a second final judgment. It's just the final judgment from a different angle. It's a bit like Genesis 1 and 2. Two different accounts of creation from different angles, not two different creations. And now, as always, John isn't making up his own picture of the final judgment. This comes straight out of Joel 3, Isaiah 63, and Ezekiel 32 in the Old Testament, all speaking about the wine press of God's judgment. In other words, this warning we're reading about is nothing new. God has been warning the world of the foolishness of our rebellion for literally thousands of years, both before and after Jesus came. God is going to bring about his glorious perfect kingdom on earth by destroying his enemies, and his judgment will be devastating, and it will be inescapable. That's the message of this horrific imagery. God might be using shock tactics, as it were, but maybe it's shock tactics that we need to wake us up. But as always, don't take any of these things literally. Some people have literally worked out how many liters of blood it would take to reach a horse's bridle for 300 kilometers and how many people that's going to equate to. It's about 350 million, I believe. But friends, that is to completely misread the book of Revelation. The number 1600 comes from four times four times a thousand. God's judgment coming to all four corners of the earth, extending in all four directions, north, south, east, west, and a thousand representing a great multitude, as we've seen over and over again in the book of Revelation. In other words, all sin in every corner of the world will be punished and get its just reward. In other words, no sin will be left unpunished, as Proverbs 11 puts it. There will be no escaping God's judgment. You see, Jesus, the one who was victorious over sin and death and the devil, is going to save his people by judging and destroying the devil. In chapter 12, we saw that the devil was defeated, but not yet destroyed. But here is the end of Satan, and not only of Satan but the end of all who cooperate with him and who share his view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me wrap up this morning. No matter how you read it, this message is difficult to stomach. God's judgment is both thorough and conclusive and final. There will be no appeals. And most importantly, there will be no objections, not even from those who are judged for Jesus will be completely fair. And that's why it's so important that we hear the message of this chapter. You know, when you're about to drive into oncoming traffic on the freeway, the kindest thing your passenger can say is, stop, you idiot. Turn around. Get on the right side of the highway. You see, we all start out life in the wrong lane, heading into oncoming traffic. And Revelation 14 is here for God to say, stop, get back into the right lane. The warnings in this chapter are not God being mean, but God being kind. Just as the consequences of driving your family the wrong way on the freeway are going to be too terrible for words, so the consequences of ignoring God's warnings are going to be, well, too terrible for words. Friends, will you stop? Will you reconsider? Will you repent? Will you get into the right lane before it's too late? Maybe someone present here or online today needs to hear this unapologetic warning from God that he is giving us. Please, don't let this message be wasted on you. Let's pray. Well, loving Heavenly Father, by your Spirit, please give us eyes to see these hidden realities that you have now revealed in your word to us today. And please help us make the changes we need to make in the light of your coming judgment and your coming kingdom. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, friends, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, don't rush off. There is tea and coffee. Do stay. And uh, chat to Rob and Sue. Come and introduce yourself to them. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.